Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm sorry I can't be with you today, uh, but I'm going to try to give you some basics on price discrimination from an economic point of view. <clears throat> First off, what is price discrimination? Price discrimination legally is, well, when we have dissimilar conditions to equivalent transactions. So we're selling something in a different way to different people. Economics is more focused on the price relative to cost. So if I have a, an item that costs more, well, it's pretty obvious that I can probably have a higher price for that item. If I have a product that costs less, well, I'm probably going to have a lower price. <clears throat> but what happens when the marginal cost for two items is the same? So the additional cost of producing one more item is the same. There shouldn't be any reason why I have two different prices unless I'm price discriminating. So if I have two similar products that have the same marginal cost, we would expect to see the same price. But in fact, if I discriminate, then we have different prices. Okay. Uh, and lastly, we use the words price discrimination to refer to the price itself, but also the method that we use to discriminate. Uh, and we'll see in a minute, uh, there are many ways we can price discriminate. Uh, you all live day to day with price discrimination and you've seen it uh, day to day. Uh, typical examples, airplane pricing tickets where we have yield pricing. Uh, so they try to fill the airplane and everybody pays basically a different price. Cinema prices, right? So you've got uh, different prices, your age. Uh, university pricing, sometimes uh, students get discounts or grants or subsidies based on their income or social situation. Uh, public transportation, uh, again, based on your age, if you're a student, uh, you pay more or less, but you also have uh, subscription-based pricing uh, in public transportation. Hair salons, women uh, sometimes pay uh, much more than men uh, to have a haircut. Um, restaurants. Uh, we have children's menus in restaurants, so you can get a burger and fries for maybe less if you're a child. Bulk discounts, uh, buy two, get one free, or buy a big pack versus a small pack and get a lower price per unit. Uh, membership discounting prices, uh, if you're a member of the cinema club, you get a lower price uh, to, for each seat. And obviously negotiated pricing when you're in a marketplace. If you go to an outdoor market, you can negotiate the price and everybody can basically get a different price. All of these are examples of price discrimination. Now to make this possible, we need three conditions. Uh, the first is I need to have some power. I need to be able to set a different price for different types of customers. And that means that I'm not in perfect competition. If I'm in perfect competition, I'm a price taker, meaning I don't make the price, I take the price. Uh, the supply and demand in the market uh, come together, so I have demand, I have supply, and it determines the price that everybody is going to pay for the product, right? It's very competitive. There's the price. I want to sell, I can sell at that price. I can't sell at a higher price, I have to sell at that price. Unless I've got some market power, I really can't fix the price. So this requires that I have a downward sloping demand curve. This means that, well, you know what? Uh, for a small amount of quantity, I can fix a high price. If I want to lower the price, well, I'll have more buyers, etc. So the high price, don't expect to sell a lot. Low price, you can sell more. Typical of a downward sloping demand curve. The second condition we have is that I have to prevent arbitrage. Imagine you sell... Uh, one person to get a low price uh, for the train and another person the high price uh, for the train or the airplane. Uh, great. But if this person that bought the low price ticket can sell it to the other person, then I'm not going to be able to sell this person the ticket. Right? They, they're just going to buy their ticket from somebody else. And this is what we call arbitrage. So I have to be able to separate these markets. I need to be able to make sure that the people that I that paid the low price, imagine you're a student, you go buy a ticket for the cinema at a low price, then you sell it to somebody for a profit for an adult. Um, great, but that means the cinema doesn't make the sale to the adult. So this, how do they get around it? Well, when you get your ticket, it says on it, hey, it's a student ticket. And they're going to look at the person that comes in and say, well, you're not a student. You know, you're 50 years old or you may be a student, but you're an old student, something like that. 
And lastly, I need to be able to, to identify who these people are. Uh, so we, we t sometimes discriminate on observable characteristics or information we've collected about the consumer. I know when somebody's old, I know somebody's young, uh, I can see if they're a woman or a man, uh, at least if they have long hair or short hair, uh, et cetera, right? So there are ways that I can, can look at the potential buyer and say, okay, I'm gonna charge this person a high price or I'm gonna charge this person a low price. There's ways to make that identification possible. These are the three conditions to effectively discriminate. Now in economics, we classify uh, three types of dis price discrimination. We call these degrees of price discrimination. The first degree is perfect price discrimination, where each person, you know, says, hey, uh, I want, you know, you say, hey, I I'm going to sell you, you know, a donut, right? So I'm going to sell you a donut. How much do you want to pay for the donut? Oh, I'll give you, uh, you know, $1 or I'll give you uh, $2 for a donut or I'll give you $3 for a donut. This is their willingness to pay. And so I sell them, you know, a donut. Hey, I'll sell them to this person for one dollar. I'll sell a donut for two dollars. I'll sell for three dollars. Great, right? Uh, but that also means that these people tell you how much they're ready to pay, and that's pretty rare. So it's kind of in theory, this is what would happen, but it, you know, you don't really know that. So we get what's called near perfect price discrimination, where we look at the characteristics of these people and say, oh, these are people that like to pay one dollar. These are People that like to pay $2 and $3, etc. Okay, uh, near price, perfect price discrimination, you're going to get it, for example, in uh, negotiations like on eBay, and when you're selling products and people are negotiating the price up and down, you're going to get an idea of their willingness to pay because they're going to increase or decrease the price accordingly. Now, what does this mean uh, if we look at, uh, you know, a, a real example? Typical example here is going to be universities. A university charges, I don't know, twenty thousand dollars for 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 a semester uh, to students. The thing is, is that not everybody pays that twenty thousand uh, per semester. In fact, if you take a whole bunch of students and say, "How much do you pay?" They'll all probably say something different. Why is that? Because they get grants and subsidies. They get price discounts from the government. Okay, so this is federal student aid, but also the college itself can offer. Uh, institutional aid to decrease the price that students pay. And they base this on the income and the wealth of the family. So families complete the FAFSA and the CSS profile online, and they have access to different uh, assistance provided by uh, the university or by the federal government, effectively lowering the price from 20,000 to 19, 18, 17, 16, five, whatever. So people pay different prices. Now, is this good or bad? And um, this is this is actually a very interesting case. Uh, in perfect competition, price price is always determined by the demand curve, right? If you if you look at a quantity and you say, well, how much uh, you know? Uh, if I look at this quantity, we'll ask the consumer, how much you ready to pay for this? Uh, and and there's the price right there. Okay, so the the demand curve basically tells us. Uh, the price. And in perfect competition, we know that price will be defined at the level of marginal cost. So in perfect competition, we get this beautiful outcome where price equals marginal cost. Uh, here I have marginal cost and average cost. The price is here. Uh, the, the amount that I make, I sell this number of units. Uh, at a price here, so the revenue is price times quantity. So my revenue is here, right? That's price times quantity. Cost, total cost is average cost or cost per unit times quantity. That's total cost. Total cost, well, here I've got average cost. It's the same value. Here I have the quantity, so my, my cost is here. So my profit is zero. My revenue equals my cost. And what's also nice here is that I have consumer surplus. And we spoke about consumer surplus uh, when we talked about market efficiency. So if I say, well, I'm going to sell the first unit by itself. And how much are people ready to pay for the first unit? Well, they're ready to pay a high price. 
you know, you walk into McDonald's, you know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm really hungry for a hamburger. How much do you want to pay? Oh, I'm ready to pay, I don't know, let's say six euros for a hamburger. And well, you know what? On the menu, it's only four euros or three euros. Whoa, I get a bonus. This is like a, a benefit for me. I was ready to pay a high price, but I really pay a lower price. So I feel good about this. It's a it's a bargain. And uh, okay, if, what about how much you ready to pay for two, two hamburgers? Well, I was ready to pay this price here. But again, the price is down here, so I get a bargain. And we can line all these bargains up, if you will, right? This is all the stuff we, we, we wanted to, to have. And I can see right away that this yellow space here, we're going to get all of this as consumer surplus. And, and that's the nice thing about competition. Now, what happens in a monopoly? In a monopolistic situation, I'm facing a downward sloping demand curve. I can set any price I want. I'm not a price taker, I'm a price maker. I can say, well, the price is here, or the price is here, or the price is here. And I'll sell a certain amount of items based on each price. The price will determine how many units I sell. And it's up to me to choose the price. I, 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 can, I can do that as a monopolist. So where do I maximize profit? Well, profit maximization is always where marginal revenue the additional revenue from selling one more unit equals the additional cost of selling one more unit or marginal cost. In this case, it's pretty basic. Right here is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. I'm going to sell this quantity we've got here. This is where I maximize profit. And the price I'm going to have from that unit, well, it's right there. There's the price. So the monopolist sets a price here, sells this quantity here. Now, what do we have? <clears throat> well, we can already see that my cost per unit, my average cost is down here, my price is here, this is my margin, right? So I've got margin. My price is above my average cost. So if we were to define this, this is gonna be obviously profit. So my price minus my average cost times the number of units gives me profit. So there we are, this is all profit for the monopolist, okay? Now, we also have consumer surplus because remember at this quantity, the people were ready to pay a higher price, but they're paying a lower price. They're paying this PM level. And at this quantity, people were ready to pay a higher price, but they're actually paying this price, a lower price. So we still have consumer surplus, just less of it. So we're gonna mark the consumer surplus we have with this green color here. So we've got consumer surplus. Now, what makes monopoly bad is that we're not producing out to where we should be producing. We should be producing way out here at the competitive level, but we're not. And so all of this, what was surplus, right? So we go back to the previous slide. This was all surplus over here. This this level here was surplus. It's now gone. It Nobody gets it. And so this is, again, what we refer to as deadweight loss. So we have deadweight loss right here, and we'll just color that blue. There's my dead weight loss, okay? And, and that's what socially economists don't like about monopoly. Now, what happens under first degree price discrimination? This is pretty basic. Uh, we're basically gonna look at every quantity and say, how much are you ready to pay, your willingness to pay? And let's say, oh, I'm ready to pay uh, this amount here. And what about a little bit more? Well, I'm ready to pay this amount here. And what about a little bit more? I'm ready to pay this amount here. And what about a little bit more, et cetera. So the, the, the monopolist would basically, or somebody with power is going to say, well, for this amount, I'll charge this price here. And they make you know that amount of revenue. So revenue is going to be, and I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to just, uh, how much are you ready to pay here? I'll pay this amount here. Okay, so that's the price you pay. How much are you ready to pay here? Well, I'll pay this price here. Okay. And you'll do this out until this point where, you know, if you go beyond this point, if I say, okay, I'm going to sell, how much are you ready to pay? Well, I'm ready to pay this amount. Hey, but that's below my cost, which is here. So uh, I'm not going to do it. So what's happening here is the monopolist that perfectly price discriminates extracts all of the potential surplus from the consumers and turns it into profit. So we can see before that we, we were stopping here at 
QM as a monopolist. And they had this red profit here. Now, what have I got? This is kind of a really cool uh, situation. I've got a situation where my profit becomes all of this, right? I go out to that level and I've created a huge amount of profit. This is my revenue that's above my cost, which is down here. Um, and I've, and I've extracted all the consumer surplus for the producer. Now, is that bad or good? It's a question of fairness. But from an economist's point of view, okay, fine. Because we get to this same level of output. We get to this level of output in the economy. Somebody gets it. There's no deadweight loss. Somebody gets it. The producer gets it. The consumer gets it. All good. Second degree price discrimination is when we give discounts on volume. So you've all encountered this probably. You go to the grocery store and, and students, uh, you're probably looking for a deal, right? You're saying, hey, I want a deal on beer. I want to buy some beer. What do you do? You buy the 24 pack or the 36 pack or the 100 pack or whatever, and you, and you store it. And this allows you to get the lowest price per unit, right? Um, this is also called bundling. We, we bundle stuff together, similar items or dissimilar items. When you get a pack for a car, for example, you can have the, the sport pack or the luxury pack or the uh, executive pack or, or whatever. Uh, and we bundle items together to, to give a deal. So a second degree price discrimination is, is typically quantity discounts. And this is approximating first, first degree price discrimination. And you'll see that in a second. So for my six pack, I get 310 a liter, 12 pack, it's 276. And these are the actual prices. If you go online at Carrefour, you're going to find these prices. And the price per unit, right, which is what the demand curve gives us, decreases as the quantity increases. Typical. So what does this mean? Well, this means that if I buy, let's say, a, a six pack. Okay, so here's my six pack. Oh, pardon me, I'll, I'll do it with a different color. So I'm going to go for a six pack. Boom. So I'm going to go for a six pack. Oh, shoot. Let's try it one more time. So I'm going to go for a six pack, and my price is here. 12 pack, I double it. There's my 12 pack. The people are ready to pay that price. And my 24 pack is out here. And people pay this amount. Now, <clears throat> what do we have in terms of areas? In the six-pack case, so I got six uh, beers, and I'm selling them for the price for the six-pack. Uh, the revenue generated by the firm, well, let's see. I got total revenue. My cost is down here, so my profit is going to be this area here for those six units where price is above, remember my, my cost per unit is down here. Cost is down here, my price is here. This is my margin, so I'm selling six beers. So that's my, that's my profit. And lo and behold, we also have some consumer surplus, which is great. Consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve and above price. Oops, probably needs to change color. So it's gonna be this area here. Now let's go out to 12, the people who buy the 12 pack. I'm going to buy 12. What's the price you're paying? Well, you're paying the price over here, P12. Again, we can calculate the profit. The profit, the additional profit of those units here is going to, we're going to add this in. Bingo. And again, we have the consumer surplus for these people. They're ready to pay more, but they don't. And lastly, we have the 24 pack which is out here. And as you can imagine, I've got a price which is down here, P24. So what do I have now? I've got my profit. And you've probably figured, oh, I made us change color. So I've got my profit down here. Revenue above cost. And hey, guess what? I've got a nice amount of consumer surplus for the consumer. And we stop at 24. Right? And so we have a situation where we're not producing out to where we would like to be, which is here, right? This is where competition produces. This is the, the great competitive level of output. So we do have 
some dead weight loss. And again, this could be considered maybe the a negative element of second degree price discrimination. It's not perfect. Okay. Third degree price discrimination is based on different types of demand. So maybe the elderly have different types of demand. Maybe uh, when you buy uh, a trip during the high season, it's a different type of demand. And we're we're trying to get at different elasticities. We're trying to understand, well, what's the elasticity of demand? Because we know that people who have alternatives have uh, more elasticity, right? If I have an alternative, I'm more elastic demand, you raise the price, I won't accept it, right? Uh, if I have an inelastic demand, however, all right, uh, I don't have options and well, I'm kind of stuck. So we would expect to see higher prices for inelastic demand and if we have an elastic demand somebody who can have different options at their disposal I can do something else I'm going to be more responsive to price increases well we would expect to see a lower price for these people so typical examples of this uh, in in day to day life here you've got um, when you go uh, buy a new car you, you walk in and you can hey hey I've got a I've got something to I have an old car here this guy's got an old car and, but you're also going to have buyers that don't have an old car. Well, who has an option? Well, the person who has the option here is going to be, you know, a little bit more elastic demand. The, these people can say, well, I don't need to give up my car today. I can do it later. And so they have an option. People without a used car don't have an option. So what happens? Well, you, you, you buy a, a car, right? I buy a car and the price is, I don't know, let's say 20,000 euros. And the people with a used car get a discount. They get, hey, minus 3000 because I handed my trade, so I only pay 17000 If I don't have a used car, I pay the full price of 20000 There you go. Somebody who has a more elastic demand pays less than somebody who does not. And that's the technique we use to chain charge a different end price. Gas stations on the freeway, right? So you're on the, on the tollway. You don't have an option, you're going to pay a higher price. Uh, here we've got, for example, cinemas. Uh, the demand for adults, le we're less price sensitive. Demand uh, adults are less price sensitive. The, uh, they can accept higher prices, so they're going to pay you know, a higher price. Uh, travel during high season and low season. A less elastic demand during travel and high season. I really want to go on vacation, you know, well, you're going to pay a higher price. This is typical. Right. What does this mean in terms of uh, monopolist? Here I've drawn it out for you. Here you've got on the right side the entire demand. Here you have adult cinema tickets. Here you have student cinema tickets. And we can see that this demand here is much less elastic. It's a more elastic demand, more responsive to price changes. And the total, when I add them all up horizontally, I get this funky demand curve over here. Now, if I was a monopolist, I'm going to fix my price again, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so we see a price for adults, which is going to be up here, a price for students, which is lower. And if I were to put everybody together, we'd probably have a something in the middle, uh, in the middle price. What does this mean for profit for the monopolist? Uh, well, the profit for the monopolist is going to be in this case here. Oops, let's let's put red. So the profit from the monopolist is here. Then I got this profit here. And if I were to put them all together, I just make this profit here. Now, probably these two here increase profit beyond this amount over here on the right. So it, it makes sense. Consumer surplus also is up here and up here. So consumer surplus, I'm gonna have this area up here and this area up here. And then we've got consumer surplus here. And then we've got the question of deadweight loss. Before, uh, if I combine everybody, I got a total deadweight loss, which is here. And it looks like the deadweight loss is actually less by discriminating the sum of those two other areas, here and here. So this is what we call third degree price discrimination. More inelastic demanders pay a higher price, basically. Okay. Typically, profits go up. When we do this and the firms extract consumer surplus, and we can see that here, uh, the profit, the red areas looks bigger. Will we get um, 
allocative efficiency, meaning that we decrease the dead weight loss, it depends. It depends. But in most cases now in, in law, we basically think there's nothing intrinsically unfair about price discrimination. So we tend to, economists will tend to advise agencies, competition authorities to start with a default um, that, hey, you know what, uh, this is okay, but it, this can be rebutted. Presume that it's benign. Presume that, hey, you know what, price discrimination is something we see. And in fact, it can actually help consumers. We can actually have consumers getting access to products they could normally not access. You know, if, take, for example, student loans. So there's nothing really intrinsically unfair about price discrimination, but it can have, in some cases, some negative effects. Some of those effects are due to market distortion. Okay, so by discriminating the price, by changing the price for the uh, buyer, um, we actually get some distortions in markets. And this is typical between a manufacturer and a retailer. So the manufacturer produces a product and they sell it to a retailer who then sells it to consumers, right? And as always, we're looking at the competition between these, these uh, retailers and the impact that level of competition will have on the end consumer. Let's take a simple example. Imagine you have two retailers, one with a very inelastic demand. So we're gonna expect a high price and one with a very elastic demand, so we would expect a low price from the manufacturer. Problem here is that maybe this inelastic demand is also associated with a, a retailer that is very, very efficient. They're, they they basically produce tons of, they sell tons of products, they drive down their costs really low, and they're super, super efficient, but they have inelastic demand. And here we have a situation where maybe the, the company is extremely inefficient. You know, their costs are really high, they're doing a bad job. What we like is that the inelastic, this very efficient firm continues to exist and pass on their efficiencies to the end consumer. But because their demand is inelastic, they're receiving a higher price. We already talked about this. This is third degree price discrimination. So efficient firms with less elastic demands are being penalized. And that's not good. Another option here could be a distortion because, hey, maybe I have a very inefficient retailer over here, right? And this very inefficient retailer who has really high costs, which, and they're gonna pass these high costs on to consumers, restricting output. Maybe this very inefficient uh, retailer can threaten to supply themselves. Say, hey, if you don't give me a low price, I'll just do it myself. I'll set up my own factory. There it is right there. And I'll supply myself. So they use this leverage to negotiate a low price from the manufacturer. And again, this is not what we'd like. We'd like the efficient retailer to benefit from their efficiency in some way. So the consumer will be hurt by this. Now, in Europe, and, and I'm sure Caroline will talk about that, that uh, we do prohibit firms from applying dissimilar conditions to equivalent transactions with trading partners if the latter are placed at a competitive disadvantage. Are we placing a trading partner at a disadvantage through price discrimination? Now, this is again a question of distortion. We're the, the manufacturer is providing a product to a retailer at a discriminatory price, and that puts them at a disadvantage, and we're distorting the downstream market. So here we've got a situation where, I'll go back to my drawing, we have an upstream manufacturer, the retailer, and downstream we've got this, the consumers. So by, by modifying the price here, I'm, I'm giving an efficient firm a really, really high price, I'm putting them at a disadvantage relative to their competition, and therefore I'll be harming eventually the consumer. So it's a secondary impact, okay? Secondary line injury. Um, so the European Union is very concerned about, are we distorting the downstream markets? Are we making, are we basically taking a market that should be competitive and making it non-competitive or less, less competitive? 
some simple examples of this. Um, here's a really good example of market distortion and, and um, price discrimination. If you if you go to Orly Airport, this was back in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. So ADP, Aéroport de Paris, managed Orly Airports. And there was a provider of services called Alpha, which is here, Alpha Services, Alpha Flight Services, and they would provide meal services and cleaning services, whatever, to the airplanes that were there. And Group ADP, you know, said, okay, we'll, we'll give you the contract. And they had an exclusive contract for a while. They were the only uh, ground handling service at Orly Airport. They won the contract. And they paid a fee to Aéroport de Paris to service all the airlines. And then Air France launched its own service provider, OAT, or Servair. OAT is a subsidiary of Air France. Okay, so we have an airline company that owns its own service supplier at ADP. And it turns out that ADP, well, they were, you know, telling uh, Alpha, hey, you got to pay a fee, you know, to, to have this service provision, and they were collecting money from Alpha. Uh, they also went to Surveyor or OAT, uh, again, a subsidiary of Air France, and had them pay a fee. But surprisingly, their fee was lower. So they had a lower fee, right? So imagine you've got a subsidiary of Air France providing services to Air France, right? And they're also paying a lower fee to Aéroport de Paris. Well, this isn't very cool. So they were having different fees. That's discrimination, okay? But what's the impact on the market? Well, the impact on the market, again, is going to be downstream. Uh, because these fees are a large percentage of their cost for alpha, uh, this put alpha in a, in a situation where they really couldn't compete against OAT. Uh, so the fees charged by ADP were a large part of their cost, and this impacted their competitive position, and they started losing customers. Now, the other thing that happened was that ADP or, or ADP used its dominant position. Okay, so we see that uh, they, they discriminated fees. And the fear here also for the commission was that this would harm competition way downstream here, right? And we can see why. If Air France was paying a lower fee to uh, OAT to get its services, then Downstream, the consumer here for Air France could pay less. And obviously, so if I'm OAT, for example, what am I going to do? Hey, I'm going to charge a, a nice low price to Air France. Maybe I'll charge a little bit higher price to the other people, right? And so Air France is benefiting from its own subsidiary, having much lower price than competitors and rivals. And so this discrimination upstream here led to decreased competition down here, a market distortion. Here we have another example. This is exploitation of a dominant firm position by British Airways, and we'll finish with that. So British Airways uh, worked with travel agencies, which we can see here. So we have an upstream supplier of, of flight tickets to a downstream supplier uh, that supplies vacation packages to consumers. These were all based in the UK. And so British Airways went to these travel agencies and said, hey, you know what? Uh, we're going to fix a objective. We're going to fix a sales objective of flight tickets on British Airways. And if you go over your objective from the previous year, the next year we'll give you a lower price for airplane tickets. Typical price discrimination. Okay. So if each of these places exceeded their objectives, they get a lower price for airplane tickets from British Airways. Well, you can imagine what happened when we saw this, right? So the, the competition authorities looked at this and said, whoa, wait a minute. This is distorting the downstream market. Because if BA is basically rewarding all of these uh, companies, the travel agents, with lower and lower tickets, the more they sell, what do you think is going to happen to their sales from other airlines? So this turned out that BA was basically creating an entry barrier, okay, and de facto exclusive dealing. 
they were basically limiting access to the market by Aer Lingus, uh, Lufthansa, Air France. They couldn't get into these different uh, places because of this discriminatory pricing. Uh, and, uh, and so they were found guilty. Uh, and we talked about object and effect, and there you go. A BA awarded loyal travel agents and discriminated between travel agents with the object and effect of excluding rival airlines from the UK market. And so we have a, a market distortion because of that. So there you go. You've, you've gone through, we've gone through what is price discrimination. We've looked at the three different levels, and we've given an example of why price discrimination may not be Good, but we also see that price discrimination can be good for consumers in some cases because it allows companies to sell product when they could not otherwise do so. I hope you enjoyed that and good luck for the rest of the day.